Hi, good morning all. How are we doing today? Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Sorry, I didn't have in these airports. Sorry. I'm talking to the computer and I get no sound sound back. But the class actually starts at 9.30. I see that Miguel sent the link for nine, I guess to ensure that everybody gets on. But so let's give um everybody else a few minutes to to come into the Zoom meeting. Um we all good today. Hello, morning. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, morning. I'm good. Okay. How are you? Good, fine, thank you. I see that Elias made it. Welcome, Elias. I'm thank happy you. Got on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. And we can hear you, and you can hear me, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, very good. Very good. Welcome. So, have we been reading our very short chapters, Savannah? Okay, Savannah may have walked away. What about Delmaro? Delmaro, did you get an opportunity to read? Yes, ma'am, I was able to do a little reading. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so what about the newspaper? Did you read the newspaper this week? Yes, ma'am, I see, so we were talking about the Bahamas being blacklisted again by the European Union. Okay, so you're gonna because share. Of why what why are we being blacklisted because of what uh our weak approach to anti-money laundering we're not doing enough according to according to them right so um i don't know if anybody would have followed that previously but you know we put the laws in place in 2000 you know last week we talked about it only being the shell and we know why we only put in the shell because we you know 20% of our GDP was, to, um, sorry, banking, and regulation is expensive. And so the more laws we put in place, um, you know, essentially we wipe out a lot of our banking sector. And so we staggered how the laws were put in place. But of course, we had a mutual evaluation in 2017 where the FATF came in and basically stated that, you know, we didn't have any meeting our laws. Um, you know, we needed to update. So we did a whole revamp and repeal in 2018. We changed the whole legislative um, framework from rules based to um, risk based. We met um, most of the requirements, and our expectation now was that we would have come, we were on a gray list. We would have come off this gray list and we would have been okay. Um, the FATF was scheduled to come in in May and work with the FIU, work with the Central Bank, the Securities Commission. Just remember I said, we have only had one person charged with money laundering. Um, and that was a Michelle Reckley. And now subsequently the people who have been stealing from work and then the other politician just recently was charged with money laundering. The one who, I think the Campbell lady who removed the money from tourism. And so I guess they were concerned also that, you know, we had three politicians brought before the courts and so far two have been gotten off free. And so they said that we're gonna come in in May and we're gonna help you, you know, to rectify some of the issues that you may be having. Now, due to this pandemic, they were not able to come. And so the government is very surprised that, you know, cause that they blacklisted us. Now, Peter Turngrass, Ryan Pinder was previously um, the minister who dealt with this. Um, both the PLP and FNM feel that the more information that we give to the EU, the OECD, or what have you, they they ask for more. So the more regulation we put in place, they are never satisfied. And so they kind of feel like it's intentional, that there's nothing that they can do. And so I don't know. Um, I don't even follow the blacklistings anymore because I don't think there's nothing we can do to satisfy them. And I'm on um, both sides to say that we've done so much. And from our aspect, it wipes out, you know, the banking sector. And so I understand why it had to be started, but we've met, I would say, 90% of the requirements. And so I don't understand why 
um, they would have blacklisted us. But when Peter Turnquist finally got annoyed with them and told them, listen, the more we put in, the more you ask for, I think it was the OECD that said, okay, we're not gonna blacklist you any longer. We're gonna let the individual countries blacklist you. And so um, countries in the European Union, like Germany and the UK and the Netherlands and what have you, they individually blacklisted us immediately. So it doesn't look like the body, the full international body, but it, it, the country itself. So the Netherlands blacklisted us right away. And then France came behind and blacklisted us. But when we look at the persons who are on these boards, who are blacklisting us in these various countries, as the same persons who are on the board, so the prime ministers and the minister of finance of these various EU countries are the ones who are on the boards or work very closely with um, the persons in the EU or in the OECD who would do the blacklisting. And so, you know, finally they decided that, you know, we need to see that at, at the table. This is the only way, um, you know, we may stay off this list. We need somebody physically there on these boards advocating for the Bahamas to say that this is what we have done. Um, this is the agreement you are supposed to, you know, liaise with us first. We are supposed to have discussions. You are supposed to give us a time um, period or time frame so we can rectify whatever the issues are. But at present, we don't have any seat at the table, and so there's no representative there to advocate on our behalf. So we could use this experience in our er er everyday life. You know, um, everybody that comes to these classes, I consider them to be future leaders. And so we need to upgrade ourselves. We need to up educate ourselves. We need to network ourselves. Uh, I mean, network with each other and either create our own table or make sure that we have a seat because when we have other persons making decisions on our behalf and we, we can't even defend ourselves, this is what happens. Okay, so please let this just be the beginning um, of your, you know, educational development, your career development. Um, we need some um, people out there to help save our country because right now the world is in trouble and so all of these little things is going to make it more difficult for us, um, you know, to do business. It's going to affect our ratings, what have you. And so, you know, we need some some people out there to get on these OEC and EU boards uh, and find out, um, you know, be some of the decision makers so we can make decisions in our best interest. Not that we want to go out there and, um, you know, break the rules, but at least have a say in, in you know, def defend your country or even yourself before, um, you know, you are blacklisted, especially during a pandemic when you need to borrow so much money. Okay, Shavado, any comment? Hi, good morning. Morning. Uh, no, not really. I mean, you said it all. I was just um, finished reading up on it actually with the the European Commission, you know, I think they were hard on us. I mean, during this time, like you alluded to the fact during this time of the COVID-19 and blacklisting, and they have other countries as well, um, you know, who they blacklisted, um, who are in the, well, including Panama, Barbados, Jamaica, Cambodia. Um, I see here where Tanya McCartney, the Bahamas Financial Services Board, some um, chief recommend, chief executive, she also um, agreed with the sentiments of uh, the, I think this the Attorney General, yes, Mr. Kyle Bethel, you know, who expresses a disappointment of the EU Commission blacklisting of the Bahamas um, for that matter. So I, I, I agree with you say, you know, we need someone there as well who represents the Bahamas, you know, who can be on the board. Um, to just to see what's going on and to get an insight of things and how is it that every time, you know, like this, it, we are blacklisted and we are doing the necessary, um, putting the necessary documents and, and organizing and preparing ourselves, you know, so that we will avoid this, but yet, you know, it's just like we are cohesive into doing these things, but still, you know, we are being represented as a blacklist country. Right, right, correct. And so, and they don't even, um, take into consideration the adverse effect 
or on the country, you know, how, how many banks would have had to close up because they just simply could not afford to put in the, the regulatory framework, the various systems, hiring a compliance officer for more than $50,000 and then um, paying for monitoring, developing that department. And so a lot of banks just packed up and left or a lot of banks that had a parent, you know, they came to the Bahamas because the rules weren't as strict and um, it was cheaper to do business. And now, the, immediately when they hear that, well, the Bahamas have to update this law, or do this or do that, they close out because they, they, they would have known the cost um, or the expense to their business already in their parent company, say in Switzerland or in somewhere in Europe. And so immediately when they hear word of the same regulations are going to be mandatory in the Bahamas, they, they just close up shop and they leave. And so then you have 10 to 15 persons payments out of jobs. So, you know, nobody's being mindful or I don't know if they're expressing the mind, you know, the effect of when we put this regulation in, in place, this means higher unemployment. Um, also, in 2018, again, if you were the compliance officer, immediately when we got blacklisted, I think in 2017 or 18, you know, this was the type of information that you disseminated throughout the in, um, institution. Because compliance reads the newspaper every day and they share this information throughout the organization to whomever it's applicable. Now, in um, 2018, you know, Peter Turnquist had an industry update immediately. So compliance, we had to get dressed. We had to go down to that meeting and we had to report back to our organizations exactly what happened. What, why did the Bahamas get blacklisted again? When we got there, very good meeting, met a lot of people, network. Um, he simply said that in December, they would have put out the, the laws or signed T's for FACTA, FACA and CRS. And they sent all this information into the OECD. The OECD confirmed receipt. And so they were very surprised. The word that they got back from the OECD is that they have a technical group and the technical group did not receive word in time to remove the Bahamas from the list. And so therefore we were black, blacklisted back in 2018, even though we had met all their requirements. So that, that was why Peter Turnquist got so frustrated and answered them and said that, you know, no matter what we do, there's always a reason why you can blacklist us. And so I, I mean, I'm certain that they took offense, you know, you telling a regulator almost that they're being unfair. And so, you know, I don't even think they give us any chances to, this time. Out of all of that, they had agreed that before we blacklist you, we will discuss the reasons why we won't blacklist you. I thought this really it was their fault that they didn't get word to their technical group. And the technical group isn't allowed to, to speak to somebody else some, um, you know, off the wall story they gave. And so, um, yeah, this is why, how they came to the agreement that before any blacklisting is done, they would, you know, um, contact us. And so that's why attorney Carl Bethel is saying that he's surprised. So, like I said, back in the day, you know, these are the type of things that be disseminated through the organization. And in fact, when Central Bank came in to do an on-site visit, they did ask, can you show us um, any information that would have been public, um, published by the regulators internationally or locally that you would have disseminated? And I said, really, you want me to pull out the emails? And so luckily I was able to go in my system and pull these emails out and see, show them that I did share, that I did get dressed and go down to the meeting with Peter Beth, um, sorry, Peter Turncrest. And I could have gotten an audit note had I not been able to produce that. So like I said, read the newspaper every day, especially if you're in the compliance department, that's actually a part of your job description, reading the newspaper every day and disseminating the information to the um, organization. So don't take it lightly. Don't think that Ms. Bullard just giving you so much work to do. No, I, I'm preparing you. And like I said, once you are um, in the financial services sector, you don't have to be in the compliance department, but you, you should keep current and keep abreast 
of what's, what's going on in your country and in your organization. Okay, so thank you so much for that, Damaro. Um, any, anybody else, anything else in the newspaper this week that, that we want to discuss? Anything else happen? I talking a lot, y'all still there? Good morning. Yes, Good morning. we are. Hi, question, did we talk about uh, uh, Dr. Dwayne Sands? No, no, we didn't. We talked about the IMF um, blacklisting. Okay. Well, okay, Dr. so go ahead. You have something to say about Dr. Dwayne Sands? Yeah, Dr. Dwayne Sands with regards to that, because that can tie back into some uh, one of the 40 uh, recommendations from the, uh, I mean, uh, the FATF with regards to anti-corruption and bribery. Even though he may have been acting in good faith, you have to be ethical and, and it has to go through the right protocol and procedures. And I think that that's something that, that, that should be highlighted. And these are some of the reasons because in some, uh, I've worked, at, worked in offshore for over 30 years and some of the companies and some of the things that that, that is done is not compliant or in adherence to local regulations. And that's why it's really um, for compliance officers to comply, to ensure that their organization that they represent and that they have uh, independence and, and they report directly to the board of directors and that they use their voice because we have to ensure that we protect the jurisdiction and in protecting the, the jurisdiction, we protect, we protect the financial services sector and so our leaders have to, to, to act accordingly because it doesn't look good in the international uh, public as well because they look at these things and these things are also factored in. And sometimes we take it lightly and we think uh, it's a polit political ploy. But at the end of the day, we have to, to do the right thing. And that goes for anyone at any level because we are all accountable. We are all responsible. And I think even though he, I mean, he stepped down, which was the right thing to do, because because of the, the the nature and and the level that he was at, and even though as a doctor he took an oath to to save lives, at the end of the day, he has he has a dual respons had dual responsibility, and so he had to he still if there's no excuse not to to do the right thing and to follow protocol and and and, and ensure that you maintain your integrity and ethics at the same time. Okay, very, very good, Brenda, and very brave of you for speaking up in this F and M group. The lovers of the Wigan Sands in this group, they were well, very I, quiet. I, I, they waiting to, <laughs> they waiting to attack you, Brenda. I just want you to know. But That's like you right. said, compliance. For, for you know, we have to have the courage to speak up. We have to stop turning a blind eye when we see wrong. Um, again, we do have an anti-bribery and corruption um um law. So perhaps we need to look at that and see, you know, if he should be charged. So we're very good, Brenda. Go ahead, F and M's who wants to respond. Any F and M's, Anishka? No, that's okay. <laughs> okay, Brenda, they give me a little break. Savannah, I see Savannah. She she ready. Savannah, yeah, you have any I comments? For Jesus. No, I for Jesus. <laughs> okay, good, good. Okay, very good. Okay, so Brenda, yes, very good. Um um, he may have broken a law. Um, he definitely did not ethically, and, and we can't just say um, it was in the best interest for the um, country because we really don't even know if these people brought in um, this PPE equipment or for COVID-19. Exactly. Right. We can't mm -hmm. confirm, and then the story changed from two persons to six persons. So, and it so, was the avenue that was used. Was it the best avenue? Because they didn't have to fly in to bring those 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 uh, uh, test kits. They could have been they could have been shipped. They could have been sent to a consulate in the different uh, uh, states in the U.S. There were different means. So was that the best uh, and timely uh, 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 route in order to get it to the country? And you know, did we did we look at look at everything to see? You know. Okay. So. Case, as, go ahead. He may get away with that because let me tell you what happened initially when we had ordered some PPE equipment from the U.S. Initially, Donald Trump had stopped our shipment. I, I, and, yeah. and so then he came on, he had stopped shipments for a few countries. And then he came on and said, you know, I have to make sure that the U.S. 
has sufficient equipment before right. we sell it but, uh, to other countries. Absolutely. And I also had to check it for drug trafficking. Right. So, but again, also Sydney Colley, Sydney Colley, the ambassador to the to the U.S., uh, one of the ambassadors to the U.S., he was he was the middleman, and that's who it should have gone through. I Me mean, after going through protocol with the cap, the prime minister and the cabinet, them making that decision, and then it should have been diverted to ensure like that because because they got that those shipment cleared, they they should have already uh, uh, set up a a link or an avenue how to get these the protocols to get these through without any any other interference. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So oh, that, okay. that's, that even make that makes it worse because they already had that challenge so now they would have known how to overcome that because of because of that prior incident and then they had said that everything is it's clear so they can go ahead and 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 get the get the um the uh the equipments are clear to come to the bahamas so i i i don't know yeah but so that's going to be difficult of course they're going to use that right. as the reason why but you know it may be difficult to prove okay shibato you want to add Oh, yes. Um, well, there's a lot to this story. See, we only um, basically going off on what we hear and, and you know, face value, mm -hmm. um, because I don't think there's only Dr. Sands involved. Of course, you have the clearance from aviation, and that's Minister Denise Diagla, then immigration um, as well, you know, to get the, the, for the flight to be cleared and stuff like that to land. And I think he was blindsided by the fact that how many persons were on board because he probably only knew about let's say the cargo itself the ppes and uh, maybe like two two passengers excluding perhaps the pilots so it happened that when they came they say okay we're going to pull a number on them in exchange for our ppes we're going to ask them you know so we could disembark the flight as permanent residents so that and he had to make a decision right and there. And he could have said no, if, especially especially if he was blindsided. Especially if he was blindsided. In uh -huh. fact, the law had said the planes can travel out with persons because there were some U.S. citizens on the island. But yeah. he no, had authority to reject the flight, though. Right. I mean, right. he, he could have said he no. Still is at fault in any way you look at it. Right, he is that. I I don't I don't dispute that fact. But however, right, he had to in utmost good faith for the Bohemian people. Okay, we needed the um, testing kits because, like you indicated, with Donald Trump and that situation, um, with the testing kits being brought back and then came back to the Bahamas again. So back and forth with that. So he made it in his in his best interest a decisive decision right there to say, you know what, we need these kids for bringing people for yeah, this. But it was above his. But I haven't seen decision though. Right, I haven't seen any testing kits or they they would have put it in the paper. I didn't see them mention anything about the testing kits. But nonetheless, though, even even taking out all of that, there there's a proper protocol that you follow, and so we need to make sure that those checks and balances are in place. And if that was in place. By the time that got to the minister, that's all of that check, when he looked at it, all of that should have already been checked from aviation, checked from uh, 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 the minister of tourism. All of these things should have been checked. He signed off, sent it up to, to the final for the prime minister and the cabinet to approve. See, that's because we don't have the proper protocol and procedures in place. And so, so Brenda, Brenda, you agree that we should be blacklisted. Because we don't have the proper protocols in place, we should. What we should what be I'm saying is we have to improve. We have to improve our, 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 our protocols and our procedures and ensure that we we stick to them. And if there if there's any deviation from from the process, that the right authorization is received. So we can't just be willy nilly doing things, and then when it looks it's as if like we don't have any structure or management uh, management oversight or oversight in place. Right, and this is what the international bodies are concerned about. This is why they feel like they actually have to come here and in high funds help us to ensure that these protocols are in place and they are enforced. Because you know we have a lot of stuff written down on paper. Exactly. But we don't. We talk a lot too, and we no action. Yeah, right. Not, I agree with you that, that it's not it's not him alone. However, no, he, right, he he took responsibility because it fell in his lap as minister uh, as the minister of health at that time. No, but I think he 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 has an ulterior motive why he just resigned. You know, at a time like this, I I, I it's not an opportune time. <laughs> it's no during a pandemic. I don't think this was the time to resign. No, I and think he, he should have been. 
you know, he should have been, um, I guess, punished in some way. However, this as you know, during a pandemic, Agreed. Agreed. the Minister of Health should not be resigning. And the problem you know, is that like, see, he could have said that, okay, we are, we're going to this That this is not the time after, right now for him to resign. We will have a look at it, full investigation, and a decision will be made after we come through this pandemic. Yeah, so okay, but, 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 but y'all do yeah. know that the yeah. wind signs... Sorry, go ahead, Chibato. No, I say, well, it was told or uh, sources that at first he did reject the, the resignation, but I guess Dwayne Sands was adamant about resigning, so he had to accept. I don't even think it's Dwayne Sands. I just think it was the people who, who, who made it known that, hey, this, this man just let people in our country. We don't know if they're sick. Yes, they're supposed to be residents of the Bahamas, and they live in life with key, but... I just personally think that they paid to get back in the country. Right. And, and I don't know if you all remember the way Sands has crossed a uh, Hubert Minutes a few times. Yeah. Remember uh, the way uh, Hubert Minutes had hired him when Anisha Rule um, resigned and put him in the Senate. Then he joined forces with Loretta <laughs> for yeah. Prime Minister and what have you. And so... I think um, Minutes just let it rest because this is like the third time he would have been crossed by the way time. And I don't know, you all don't read the punch now, but the punch say that he is now, he could form a, a party with Lee Strickman and Travis and become the legal opposition and put the PLP out of the house. And anybody see that? I saw uh, that. I saw that. You all don't read yeah, the punch now. That's yeah, awesome. I saw that. I saw that. I saw yeah, and, and really, I, I, I believe. That. I believe that's why he was so willing to just resign. And he's my my good representative that I give a D rating or an F rating. Yeah, he's my good why representative. would you give up so easily? Yes. So election would in, in two years, uh, you know, pay attention. I, I would not be surprised if he doesn't even wait till election but forms his own party. Because I, I think he is after the leadership. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. And I'll be wrong again. But that is my strong belief. When I, when, after I saw it come across the news headlines, I say exactly my thoughts. So, it, you know, look out for it. Look out for it. I won't be surprised. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So very good. We've been keeping abreast. We've been reading our newspapers. And of course, these are the types of conversations that we want to have, um, you know, when we go to our Toastmasters meetings. Um, these are the water cooler conversations that we have with our CEOs and, and the persons on the executive team to, to show them that we, we are knowledgeable. We know um, what we're talking about. So, of course, we would, you know, the way in science would have been the water cooler um, conversation, but the blacklisting um, by the IMF, we would have disseminated that through the organization. If there were meetings, we would have gone out and attended those meetings and brought word back, you know, to our executives, because more than likely they are going to be the ones who are interested and, you know, send a follow-up of this is what occurred at the meeting and this is the reasons and this is the, the plan going forward. Okay, so when you meet these people, we don't want to talk about what we're wearing or what we're eating and taking a picture and all those things. We want to have knowledgeable, educational um, um, conversations and these is what, you know, the corporate Bahamas, this is what they talk about. Okay, so keep Keep abreast and keep up to date. Okay, very good. I'm very, very pleased. And I saw a lot of you, most of you, one or two of you may need a spanking for not handing in your homework, but for the most part, I think I got 95% um, homework to my email and the ones, some people were extra diligent and they, they sent it in last week. And so those persons who would have sent it in, um, Last week may have gotten their grade back already, but everybody else will get their grade back by um, next week, Friday. Some Somebody was speaking just now? No? Okay. Okay, good. So um, homework was manageable. I know somebody questioned about the number of essays and, and what have you. And any comments regarding the number of essays and the homework? No. No? Okay, oh, Miss 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 Bullet, I have a question. Go I ahead. see that we have two essays due next week, Friday. Was there come some kind of mix up with the date? No. Um, question three and four, both of them are due Friday. Right. So okay. again, remember you only have to do three essays in total, so you don't have to pick three and four. You have an option. You could 
pick three okay. or four. Right. So there are two essays due every week. So you decide which everybody should have completed the mandatory essay, chapter two. And so you could select whenever you want to do the second and the third. It's up to you. So, but I wouldn't advise if you do two in one week. Okay? Yes. Okay, good. Good. Um, and oh, I'm very impressed. Um, Brenda. Brenda, you use my um student of the week. Brenda okay. um ran out and she invited us all to her Kawana's um a meeting via Zoom and she took along, I think, four or five persons with her. Brenda, um, is somebody going to speak on behalf of the meeting? I, I want somebody new. And I would just want to thank you for taking the initiative right up front and, and getting the network started. So one of the persons that, or two of the persons that attended with Brenda, can you please um, give us an overview of how the meeting was? All right. Um... Good morning, everybody. Morning. I attended the meeting last night. Um, it was very interesting. Um, it's my first time actually attending a Rotary meeting. Um, it was hosted by Dr. Friend, who talked about stress, uh, stress on the job, and ways to combat the stress. Um, it was interesting because some of the things that I realized that some of the things that we do or that I do, I wasn't even, re um, didn't even notice that it was related to stress or it's connected with stress. Um, she talked about, you know, coming home and leaving the office at home, leaving the office at the office. Um, and I find myself coming home, I may not physically bring the office with me, but mentally you're bringing the office with you. And I am constantly thinking about what I'm supposed to do for the next day or what I forgot to do that, that particular day. And so she talked about, you know, debriefing when you come home, setting, a, a, setting aside time to basically unwind and um, putting down the computer, putting down the phone. And it was very, very interesting. And I learned a lot last night. Okay, excellent, Anishka. Happy that you had the time to join and happy that you left inspired. See, yeah. Brenda, you're changing lives already, Brenda. Good job. Uh, any, anybody else? <laughs> Anybody else attended and, and feels the same way? Come yeah, on, Chum I I Go felt ahead. like this was a the Rotary Club was a Kiwanis. I mean, sorry, the Kiwanis Club was oh, sorry a um if to me it was knowledgeable and then apart from the topic about stress just to see how they interact with each other. It's not always serious business all the time. They, you could see that they are well connected and just to know the amount of work that they do in the community, whether it's in Pinewood or Elutra, it makes you feel like you wanted to, you want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm just knowing that they they not only give back, but they actually do the work themselves. Like they don't just, they don't just give you the money and say, okay, this for whatever. If something needs to be done, they come together and they do it. And that was, to me, that was very fascinating. Okay, very good, um, Deandra. And I do hope that you were so fascinated that you're gonna return and get into, you know, no more, we go into the fish fry or we going out to the dock or to have to drinks. We go into these meetings where we will leave inspired and we can give back to our communities and then we can have our seats at the table and be knowledgeable with our network, right? So, okay, excellent, excellent. 
Shivaro, you want to say something? Right. Uh, I, 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 um, I was there as well as a guest. Thank you again, Brenda, for the invitation. The Guanas group. This is the first time I went to one before, but this is the first time on Zoom. Guanas of Pinewood, Annie Luthra. I'm just piggybacking on the heels of my other um, colleagues who they indicated or mentioned about Kiwanis, nonprofit organization that, you know, mainly for community outreach, community building, et cetera, and just networking with each other, which is very essential right now, and getting, you know, getting um, support and help from each other and reaching out to the communities. One of the other highlights was about the, the doctor, I think it's Dr. Friend. Yeah. Um, yes, she mentioned about well, dealing with the stigma of mental health illness where, where, where you sometimes, you know, feeling down, you feeling stressful, you know, different symptoms and common symptoms that we perhaps face when we don't even know that we are actually having some type of mental health um, symptoms. And also, um, you know, having that balance between work and life and home or something like that, for example, you know, sometimes we get caught up so much, especially during this time of the pandemic, we get caught up so much with COVID-19, you know, every time you turn on the news, COVID, 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 COVID. And uh, you need to give your time, some rest from social media, mentally, you know, put your phone out. I think she mentioned she put her phone out two, three hours, you know, just talk with her, her family, you know, and talk with her friends, whoever like that, who are not, you know, because as a doctor, you know, she's right in the front line of things. So she talks to her mother, or who was, or any other family member who are not even experiencing that, or uh, you know, in that particular arena of a healthcare worker, so you can get your mind released from that toxic um, vibe and to something else more relaxing. So yes, that's that was a great meeting, actually, very interesting. Okay, excellent, excellent. I'm so glad that you took the time to attend and and you found it beneficial. Okay, so we want to not just learn about AML, but we want to, you know, have full corporate development by the time we leave this class. We want to, you know, be on our ways. I mean, of course, you're already there developing uh, who you are um, corporately. So very, very good. Very good. Okay, so I hope you also had time to subscribe to your regu um, regulators or the Bahamas Services Board or AIBT or BACO. You can sign up with um, the Bahamas Association of Compliance Officers as a student. So they have a membership fee. Normally, um, your company would pay the membership fee, but I think you have to send in a CV, fill out a form, and you can sign up as a student because, again, they also have a lot of industry um, briefings, industry updates. Um, Tanya McCartney at the Bahamas Financial Services Board, she recently wrote a book on becoming a compliance officer, getting your feet wet, um, some tips on how to get out there um, in the corporate world and fit in and, and um, some very pertinent information. And so that book is at the Institute. So when you see Ms. Dean, if you're interested, um, you can um, get more information about the book from um, Mrs. Dean. Okay? Okay, so very good. I'm very inspired. We are definitely on the, the right track. And five points immediately. So most of you already have your 10 points like Brenda and I know Brenda's name and I know Deandra's name and um, <clears throat> Shabato. I, I, I know them already within the first week. So very good. Um, five oh. points, five extra points. You already have 15 points. So you on the way to getting that A plus. So stay on track. Very good. And so the <clears throat> rest of you join, join with them. Okay, and so there are other groups online. Um, so feel free if you want to find one on your own, or um, I don't know if Brenda minds getting an email from any of you if you need some assistance. Cause I'm sure that Brenda, your your group has a meeting weekly or monthly. Uh, I'm not a part of this particular group, but uh, they do have a meeting every 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 other week on Tuesday and Friday. The Lucha group is uh, Zoom mainly right now. And that's on Fridays at 7 p.m. And the Pinewood group is on Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. And I'm also reaching out to the Toastmasters to see if they have any Zoom. I know Club 1600, but that's all men group. I'm trying to see if any of the other groups have a Zoom. 
um, Shabbat may be able to yes. assist me because he's also a, a competent Toastmaster. Mm-hmm. And perhaps we can, we, can, um, we can do that. And I think somebody had mentioned last week about the Rotary, I think the Rotary Club of uh, West, I think it is. They, they normally do a, a Zoom, but I'll, I'll check into it. And then I can I can send, but, but the email, I think what we need to do, as you had mentioned last week, is perhaps create a WhatsApp group. So if everybody can put their um, their numbers in the chat, I will take those down and, and create a WhatsApp group so you can, the information is uh, disseminated more quickly. And so if you're able to attend, the information will be right there and, and you'll have that option if you want to, to, to uh, attend either one of the, the groups that we, we, we get in contact with. Okay, excellent, Brenda. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Okay, good. So, sorry, somebody else is speaking? Yes, good morning. Sorry. Morning. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on what um, everyone said regarding the um, Gowanus meeting last night. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say thanks, Brenda, for the... Um, um thanks for um letting us you know be a part of that um in regards to the um there was a contact that mr c i think he left he left his contact last night for persons who wanted to um be added to whatsapp damien sweden yeah damien sweden yes yes he added to the um WhatsApp group for a meeting at six thir- at yeah six thirty on Tuesday. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, what I also learned about that, um, Mr. I think it's the, Mr. Carlton, he mentioned something about them distributing meals like last week th- last week to um individuals in Rock Sound, and that was about fifty one meals. And I think he said they were doing an additional 30 something today in um, Tapham Bay. So this was actually my first one. I did not even know that um, it was very interesting and knowledgeable knowing how they actually go into the community and and distribute. And he also, someone also mentioned something last night about sometimes they even go into their pockets to um, fund certain events. Um, regarding the, um, I think her name was Dr. Friend. Yes, she explained the different kinds of stress. And what was so interesting is that most, thing, most things that she discussed, I realized that I actually do. You know, we don't realize that when we come home, we take on the toll of every, um, the stress that, that was in the office. And sometimes we go to bed with all of this on our mind. And sometimes all of that could cloud, that could cloud your judgment. And she also referenced finding a sleep pattern that works best for you. You know, for example, if you sleep in, say, five hours within a day and you turn around and be like, oh, I think I could, you know, stay up. But she also recommended that finding things throughout the day that you can do to actually make you tired. So that whenever you get home, you could get a good, you could get a good, a good night's rest. Because right now at this point, for this entire week, I've probably slept with, slept for about eight to 12 hours in total. And right now it's actually, you know, taking a toll. So sleep at this point is really vital. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for that. And yes, it is vital. If you don't get your rest, you won't retain anything. And you'll be groggy and, you know, cranky. And so sleep is very important. And so with all, you know, a lot of people say mental health is taboo, but it can affect all of us. And the whole point of it is that if there's help out there, just get help. All of us will need it at, at some points in our lives. So, you know, don't don't take it lightly that, um, you know, if you're, you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed or you're not sleeping properly, that you don't need some help. So let's talk to somebody. And right now, 
everything is being done over the internet. And so if you want to remain anonymous, you know, anonymously call somebody, but the important thing is to get help and ensure that you don't suffer, you know, and go from crazy to crazy or from battlefield to battlefield. But you do have that outlet. You do unwind and, and you do feel good. And that's why I say, after we finish this class, you know, it's very comprehensive. You get a lot of knowledge in, in the three hours. You de-stress, you know, turn off the computer, unwind, feel better first, and then perhaps in a day or two, look at your homework or look at your readings. But don't try and, you know, overwhelm yourself. You will find that you will retain um, things more or, you know, you'll understand better if you're calm and rested and feeling good. Okay, so very good. I'm happy that, you know, um, yeah. you all attended and, and you are all left in time. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay, so let's let's get to the chapter three before the rest of these people who you've been saying. Okay, Miss Bullet, enough. I right, let's get on to, to what we come here to learn. Okay, so thank you everybody else for being patient. And, and um, you know, I, I hope that, you know, the information shared will inspire you to also go out there and say, you know, attend these meetings and you also, you know, get some value from it. Okay, so again, chapter three, two pages, talks about our regulatory framework. And I left, um, last week, I think I told you how exactly um, these laws were even established. Um, does anybody remember? I said that, you know, the international bodies, um, they put in the 40 recommendations and I, I would have emailed and shared with you the 40 recommendations. So by now you should have had a, a, some chance to peruse it and just look, not read it in detail, not know them out of your head, but just look at look at it probably recommendation one that says countries must assess their risks and then they put controls in place to ensure that they mitigate these risks everybody had a chance to look at the fatf 40 recommendations okay silence gives consent if nobody answers me i say yes okay good so we know international bodies would have put in the 40 recommendations that was from the fatf and you should have heard about the basel committee by now they also put in recommendations and then there's another group called the Wolfsburg group and that group um primarily deals with like corresponding banking sending wires and they also have a lot of recommendations but again if we don't put these recommendations in place what happens we get blacklisted right and so therefore after the, the, the international bodies would have created all these recommendations from the, the various groups then countries go and put it into law and that's how they establish their legal framework and so many of these laws they outline crime the crime of money laundering they outline terrorism financing a new word remember i told you all that the fatf came in did their mutual evaluation in june july of 2017 and they found that we were deficient in 22 of the 40 recommendations in our laws and so in outlining terrorism, we did not um, include proliferation financing. Now, proliferation financing is kind of new. Um, I don't know if you all remember when George Bush came out with the weapons of mass destruction. And then they were there were lots of talks about, um, I guess, atomic bombs or what country had these so, um, chemical weapons. And so that non-proliferation of weapons in all the new updates was added just prior to um, 2017. It was just any money laundering and countering terrorist financing. Now it's any money laundering, countering terrorism financing, and weapons, non-proliferation of weapons. Okay, and so the acronym you will see is AML, CFT, or C2EF, because they use it interchangeably, and PF, non-proliferation of weapons. So that's a deal with like the Kim Jong-un and Iran, um, countries that have um, these weapons of mass destruction, and we want to ensure that our institutions do not do business with them. So in terms of updating the Terrorism Act, that was one of the things that had to be updated, non-proliferation of weapons. Okay, um, persons familiar with that term? 
Natasha, you've heard that term before? Um, no, ma'am, not the proliferation term. Okay, Any anybody working in the financial service, anybody in the bank? Yes. Yes, and okay, have you heard that non-proliferation of weapons? Do you know that it's been recently added and in, I think, after 217? Yeah, oh. but I, it, it has. Yeah. I never yeah. really read into it that much, though. Okay, okay, so that just means, again, what happened in 2018, um, after the law was updated, we had to go and um, update all of our central bank, updated their guidelines to add non-proliferation of weapons. And so then we had to, yeah, our internal guidelines also had to be updated to add non-proliferation of weapons. So that was one of the um, 22 deficiencies that non-proliferation of weapons was not mentioned in our laws. Again, just it was a new term that George Bush had come out with during his presidency, okay? So these laws um, outline which businesses are subject to the um, AML CFP laws. And again, I mentioned last week that prior to 2019, um, law firms, accounting firms, and real estate agents that offered corporate service provider um, that had a corporate service provider's license, which means they provided financial services to their clients. Um, they did not have to have a compliance officer on board and they did not have to um, be registered with, the, registered with the compliance commission. And so again, that was another one of the 22 um, deficiencies that the FATF found. And so again, we have to update our laws to say that it's now mandatory for those types of institutions to be registered with the Compliance Commission as the regulator, and they would not be able to get their license in 2019 until they registered, until they had the Compliance Officer on board. And so what we saw in, in 2018 was all the lawyers that you know gave the service to their clients, they showed up in the ICA class trying to um, you know get certified. But what they didn't know is in order to get approved, you needed like three or four years um, of experience in compliance as well as the designation to be able to be approved um, as the MLRO. And so they took the class with hopes that they could, you know, change from corporate law and, and just become the MLRO. In some cases, I think, depending if they had, depending on their resume and their background, they were approved. But in most cases, they said, establish your um, compliance department, get some training from that compliance person, and perhaps in three to four years, you can defray some of this cost and you may be able to become the MLRA. But that, it depends on the amount of clients you have. If you have a big book of clients, say 500 clients that you, you provide the service to, then no, they will not approve you you know, because they don't want you overwhelmed in that position. And that's what a lot of um, institutions and banks did. They just try to, um, you know, you've been in, you may be the operations manager, and right now we need an MLRO, so now you are operations manager slash MLRO. And so what the regulator has done to combat that, to ensure that, you know, persons aren't wearing dual hats and are overwhelmed and can't maintain, you know, these positions. They ask for your CV, so they want to know. They will ask for your CV as well as they ask for your job description. They want to know that you're not wearing three or four hats um, in an institution, okay? And ensure that you had sufficient training in that area before they approve you at the MLRO. Um, the laws further create a government agency to receive suspicious transactions, that's the FIU, the Financial Intelligence Unit. Um, they create requirements that report reporting entities must follow. So again, um, the positions must be approved, the MLRO. There's a senior official one and senior official two. Um, there's various reporting um, dates that um, specific information has to be sent into the regulator in 2018 as well as we always had a risk assessment due, but it wasn't enforced. And in 2018, everybody, every institution that was licensed had to create um, a risk assessment regarding AML on their business. 
and then a risk assessment for in, enterprise-wide, including all functions within their company. So the compliance officer had to work with each department, let's say they had to work with the credit department, they had to work with HR department, they had to work with the finance department and determine the risk in each of those areas, document it, put controls in place to say how we would mitigate this risk. And then they sent that document on to the regulator for approval. So all of these laws outline the requirements um, of each financial institution. And what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna share my screen. So if you look, I think there's about six or seven laws. It's the Anti-Terrorism Act, and of course we know that that deals with um, terrorist financing and to ensure that, you know, our laws are sufficient to if in 2001, when the terrorists did land in Freeport, would we be able to prosecute them? And so this is what that law had to be beefed up to include, you know, to ensure that we could prosecute them. Um, then there's the Financial Transaction Reporting Act, the Financial Re Reporting Regulations Act, the Wire Transfers Regulations, the Financial Intelligence Unit Act, the Proceeds of Crime Act, and I want to take some time and share with you the Proceeds of Crime Act because this is where, depending on what crime you would have committed, this is where you were charged based on uh, this act. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah. this is the Proceeds of Crime Act. And if we look at it, it um, I normally, these acts are, this one is 125 pages. So, and it's not layman's terms. And so this is how the law firms stay in business because even though I was in uh, compliance at retail Royal Bank, we had legal. And at um, when I worked at Trust, we did not have legal. And every time I called <laughs> legal on the retail side, they would say, you know, we're very busy. We're sorry, we can't help you. You would need to outsource your legal. So at Royal Bank, I perhaps paid 30 or 40 thousand dollars a year in legal fees for just interpreting um, um, some of these laws for me when I had to make a decision. And so I don't know if most of you ever, and I think we have some lawyers um, on in this class today, when you call the law firm, they, they're very welcoming. They say, hello, Ms. Bullard, um, it's two o'clock. And when you hang up, they say, Ms. Bullard, it's 4.30. So that means, you know, you expect a bill from two to 4.30. But they don't sit on the phone and just, you know, talk to you for free. That's how they make their money. So um, I spent thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year on a legal fees until I got some lawyers in my um, network. And I was able to call in some favors. And so I was able to save the company some money each year. Because a lot of times I just had a very basic question. Um, it was an interpretation question or how do I do this? Or what would you recommend? Or what does the law say? very quick 30 minute conversations that, you know, I didn't have to incur that cost after I developed my network. But if you look at it, um, we spoke last week about failing to disclose um, an STR. We also talked about tipping off. Remember my, my good peanut guy that, you know, Ms. Bullet opened that account for, and he brought me that $10,000. And you always ask me, Ms. Bullet, you want to take the peanut guy $10,000 and send it to the police? But, but, but I had to, right? And so also I had to ensure that I did not tip him off. And so these penalties will definitely be on your final exam. So if you look, you can see my screen. This is the proceeds of Crime Act and you wanna ensure that you don't pull up the 2000 version. Remember, everything was revamped and repealed in 2018. And so there it is, section 13 says failing to disclose and what the penalty is, and then tipping off. So I'm just going to scroll down. It says page 19. We want to look at failing to disclose. If I had said, man, it's my peanut boy, I feel sorry for him. Let him take this money and run. So if you put this in this bank, you're going to do it. Right? Let's just see what the charges would have been. Okay. There it is, section 12. And who, who is my reader today? Everybody has 10%, nobody needs to read it. Where are we reading from? 
Okay, I'm trying to pull it up right now. So section 12, failing to disclose. All right, I'll read. Okay, go ahead. This section shall apply to a person, firm, or sole practitioner engaged in one or more of the following activities. A accountancy, audit, or taxation advice or services. B, legal or notarial services involving the participation in financial or real property transactions concerning one, buying or selling of real property or interest therein, buying or selling of business entities or interest therein, the management of client money, securities or other assets, the opening or management of bank savings or securities accounts, the organization of contributions necessary for the creation, operation, or management of companies, the creation, operation, or management of trusts, companies, or similar structures. Two, a person commits an offense if each of the following three conditions is satisfied, namely that he knows or suspects or reasonably out to have known or suspected that another person is engaged in money laundering or committing an offense related to an identified risk, that the information or other matter on which his knowledge or suspicion is based or which gives reasonable grounds for such knowledge or suspicion came to him in the course of his business, that he does not make the required disclosure as soon as is practical after the information or other matter comes to him. The required disclosure re referred to in subsection two is a disclosure of the information or other matter to an officer of a body, office, or department authorized to receive the disclosure for the purposes of this part, hereinafter after referred to as the focal point officer. In the okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we could stop there. I just wanted you to get a, a, you know, an overview of how the law is set up. Okay, and then it goes down to say failure to disclose by a nominated officer. Okay, so now let's read a bit about tipping off. Okay, tipping off. A person commits an offense if he knows or, su or suspects that any disclosure under this part has been made or an action has been taken by the Financial Intelligence Unit in relation to anything under this part, and he makes a disclosure to another person which is likely to prejudice, prejudice any investigation which might be conducted following the disclosure referred to in paragraphs A1 or A2. Okay, so we wanna go down further and we wanna look at the penalties. Now, that, Failing to disclose was sections 12 to 14. So a lot of people get confused because this is one of the multiple choice questions. What is the penalty for failing to disclose? What is the penalty for tipping off? And see, this says a person commits an offense under section 1911 and is liable. But that was in section 1911. We have to scroll down. And remember now, it's 125 pages. You're trying to determine what is the a penalty and now it says a person who commits an offense under section 12 and 14 and those sections that we read were 12 to 14 and so section 2 is the actual um summary the conviction and the penalty okay right so read section 2 for us okay a person who commits an offense under sections 12 to 14 is liable on summary conviction to imprisonment for a term not exceeding 12 years or to a fine not exceeding $500,000 or to vote or on conviction on ind indictment to imprisonment for a term not exceeding 20 years or to a fine or to vote. Okay, okay, very good. So ensure you take a snippet of that. You go to the um, Pro Proceeds of Crime Act 218. I think that's page 20. Ensure that you know failing to disclose. Ensure that you know what tipping off is and what the penalty is. Okay? Okay. Okay, so that's the proceeds of crime. Act. And so in your spare time, again, you can peruse through the various laws. Um, 
a lot of it you won't understand. I, I, you know, after all my years, I still have to get a lawyer because I, I'm confused. Good that I have at least 50 lawyers now in my network, and I can save the institution some money. But we do also um, do need legal along the way. Um, so it's very good um, if you have a legal background. You know, it it helps. But it's not necessary, but it does definitely help um, you with making your decisions and ensuring that you are not breaking the law, especially when your institution does not have internal an uh, internal legal department. Okay, so the Travel Currency Declaration Act 215 as amended. Um, anybody familiar with that? Anybody knows? Um, Ms. Thompson, are you here today? Thompson? Thompson, you're speaking to us today, okay. Hopefully she'll come on later. That's Tamika, Tamika Thompson. Okay, she ain't talking to us today. Okay, but the Travelers Currency Declaration, uh, and I know all of us, have been, we, we've been to Florida, we've been to Miami shopping. And back in the day, um, the law was one-sided and Thompson could correct me if I'm wrong. But what happened was, that if you travel to America, America said that you must declare if you have $10,000 or more. We are all, you know, Natasha, are you familiar with that law when you go to Miami? You must declare if you have $10,000 or more? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, right. And so what happened is one of our very good doctors, who was a very well-liked doctor for many years, traveled to Jamaica, and she had $220,000 in her suitcase. Anybody remember that case in the news? No. No. Avery, you would have read that in the news years ago? Okay, Avery ain't responding to me yet. Okay, so years ago, um, one of our doctors... No, I was, remember. You don't Sorry, remember? I was trying to unmute. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> um, so I just want to get everybody who does not have their 10% involved. So our good doctor was traveling to Jamaica. For some reason, she had $250,000 in her suitcase, cash. And so this would have gone through, you know, the surveyor belt or whatever, the camera, and they saw this money. And so immediately they called the police and she was arrested. She was taken to the police station because of course we know that, you know, the limit for cash in banks, I think we talked about it, says $50,000. So really you don't expect persons to be walking around with $250,000. It's just not safe. And so she was arrested. And then her husband um, used to be a politician years ago. So he called the prime minister and they immediately um, let her go. Now at the time, Perry Christie was a prime minister and you know, he's a lawyer. So of course he knew the law. And the law had stated that, yeah, the US requires you to declare $10,000, but nowhere else um, um, leaving from the Bahamas. If he was leaving from the Bahamas and going to Cuba, or Canada or Jamaica, you did not need to declare because you were not going to the US. So there was no court case. They gave her back her money and she was released. So of course people said, oh, it's political, it's political, but it wasn't, it was law. And of course the FATF would have picked up on that and that would have been one of the deficiencies that would have been listed that if you have $10,000, no matter where you are going outside of the Bahamas, you must declare um that you have ten thousand dollars and so it's not only going to america anymore it's anywhere leaving from the bahamas now made it a requirement that you must declare and so they even say if you're going in a group you have to check you know some of us go away with the church and and we don't want to you know tell our church members how much money we have and so if you're going away with the group you have to ensure that you know how much money within, in, you know, the persons have the, in the group and you have to ensure that you don't have more than $10,000 cash. And it's not that you can't take it, it's just that you have to declare it. You have to fill out forms and you have to let them know where you would have gotten all this cash from so you would need your bank statement or, or, or what have you. And so we updated our laws in 2018 to ensure that it's not only one-sided, it's America um, to meet, it, you know, industry standards or international standards that anywhere you leave from the Bahamas now, you must declare. So y'all don't go to Miami and y'all get arrested. We don't want to see y'all dra getting dragged across the news. So last year, spring break, some guys, um, some Chinese men, they were from Canada, 
they were in Bahama and over the spring, spring break, they won $30,000 and they were all excited and they were celebrating. And for some reason, he, uh, the guy called his father, told his father, it's five of us and we want this money. And so we're about to travel back home. So his father advised him to share the money with each of his friends and not declare it. Now, I don't know why his father would have done that because they would have had proof that they won this money at the, the Bahama Casino and they didn't do anything wrong. What they did do wrong is not declare it. And so, of course, when they went through, I guess, what do you call it, immigration or whoever does the checks at the airport, um, it was discovered that each of them had, what, $8,000 on them. And so the five of them were arrested. This oh, father had to fly over. Yes. Okay. Yes, father had to fly over. And so they were had to go to court in two days, remanded. The money was confiscated. And also they had to pay about a $1,500 or $2,000 fine. Okay. So you all declare. Go ahead, Anishka. Um, so it's not... 10,000 per individual, it's 10,000 per, per group. group or? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. If you have, if you're traveling with three persons and between the three of you, um, you have $10,000, it's, yeah, it's a per group. And, and they do ask you. And, and I, you know, when I traveled, my sister husband was right there and we had to declare and I said, sir, how are you asking this in front of my sister's husband? How can you do this to us now? He'll be asking us for money, you know, so you, you, you have to declare. Why I'm, why I'm asking that is because um, I traveled once and I declared, even though I declared, um, the officer had said to, it was my husband and I, the officer, the officer had said to us that it's 10000 per individual. So okay. when was that? When, was that before two eighteen? Yeah. Yeah. See, yeah, that, that was, was before. Yeah, before oh, two eighteen. Okay. Right. And so the law has been updated now. They're not saying. Um. Hold, hold one second. Hold, hold one second. Somebody can't hear. Um. Anybody having a problem? Um. Elias, can you hear me, Deandra? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So it's only him. Let me just respond. I owe you all have to give me a break. You can't do two things on this computer one time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm asking him to call him, girl. He said he's back. Oh, okay. So let me just say it. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. Thank you. Hi, Miss Fuller. Yes. Now, who was speaking Hi. now? Somebody. Is were you, were you finished, Anishka? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, so per perhaps the, the law has been updated since then. Okay, go ahead. Okay, this is Tamika. There was a recent case some time back again. This is before 2018. Um, whereas there were three persons traveling and in total they had 28,000, a little over 28,000. Now, one of the concerns, and I, um, I will, my question will be pulled from this. One of the guys did declare the form of $9,000 However, it was 9,000 US and he had 1,000 Bahamian dollars. So it's still total 10,000, but they were in different currencies. His claim was that the Bahamian um, currency was something that he you know, ever had in his possession but couldn't be used in the US. What is, what is the stance on something like that if it's different currency totaling the 10,000? Again, our money is on par, so I don't... Uh, uh. I don't think there's any difference. It does not matter. You should, if if you have the money, you have, you have, you have to, to declare, declare it. it. Yeah, that's okay. my. Now I'm not a lawyer. Again, that would be depending on at the time the crime happened and what the law stated. And like I said, if that had been before 218, then I know there were some loopholes. But as it stands now, they they claim that um they have updated it and it. Ten thousand dollars, and again, you know what they do is when in, when cases happen, and depending on the outcome, then they may have to do another update. So if this person wins this case to say that yes, it was in fact 
a thousand dollars Bahamian, it was just an honest person. They are now gonna update the law to say that it depends, it doesn't matter what the currency okay. is. So he may win this one, but the person swallowing will not. It depends on how soon they, you know, update law. But I, 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 our money is on par. And so I would think even if he had euros or, or say pesos, you know, they would do the equivalent. So they are trying to say that he only put 9,000 and it should have been 10,000 on right, his he form. He 9,000 US on his form, on his US declaration form. Okay, because you normally don't, it. you don't make a declaration if you don't have more than 10,000. So that's strange mm -hmm. that he would have even been declaring a 9,000. You see what I mean? Yeah. It, it, also, um, it also depends on what is on the declaration. Is the declaration saying you have to declare U.S. currency or just currency in general? Right. Because if it's say, if it's saying currency in general, then that that includes everything. Right. Right. So I I'm not certain of how detailed it was is, but I know that a part of the update for this law, what they saw as a loophole, was that the U.S. required you to declare, not the Bahamas. Hence, that doctor got her money back, and they were very concerned that she was. I mean, she didn't do anything wrong. Um, she was just leaving her husband and taking the cash with her. So, you know, it was really her money. <laughs> and so, you know, she had another problem trying to leave after that. But hey, and look, she had to call the same husband to bail her out, even though she had done nothing wrong. Okay, so so y'all be, be, be careful. But in a nutshell, um, that's the legal system and, and the laws. And you can take some time and, and peruse the laws. Um, Demetrius, go ahead. I, I, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? No, I, you're very faint, far away. Can you come, I guess, closer to the mic? Can you hear me now? Yes, that's much better. Okay, uh, so who maintains the information? Is it something that, that like if, you, if, if something does happen when you're traveling, do they take this information and send it to some financial services or, or government agencies? What, what actually happens when when something happens, it's, for example, if you're traveling, who, where does this information go? Well, I'm not certain, but I can imagine that it'll be the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay. Right, and then they, again, they will contact the FIU, the Financial Intelligence Unit, who should have a police on staff, and then the police does the investigation. Ah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so we good. We know that when we go into Miami, if your husband there, tell him before you reach to the guy and the guy say, how much money do you have? You know, to declare it. You don't want your money confiscated. And we have had, since this law has been updated, we have had like like four or five cases in the news where um, this money has, money has been confiscated and people have been charged. So, so we don't want to find ourselves arrested at the airport. And of course, it seems as if uh, the casinos are working with um, the, what is it, Border Patrol? Because was it just their luck? Like it was spring break. I'm sure there were thousands of people traveling back and forth. How did they single them out to know that they would have had that money on them? I, I think that's very suspicious. I think somebody would have had to leak that. So if you go to Island Lock and win $10,000 and you go straight to Miami, declare, don't, mm -hmm. don't get in trouble. Okay. Okay. Any any more questions, or we can go on to chapter four. Uh, before we go on, I know um, not on the not going to the states, but the next part of the airport, Bahamas Customs they stop uh, they stop you and they ask you how much money you carry, and then they take you in the back and count the money to make sure if you say you carry in ten thousand, they take you in the back and they count that money. Oh wow. Okay. So they they are enforcing it. So very good. Yeah. Very good. Okay, good. So statutory requirements. And we all know that statutory requirements are what is required by law. And we talked about um, last week, there are five statutory requirements. One is training. That's why we are all here. Um, in, in my next class, you know, some um, persons of their work um, put them in the class and said, this is mandatory and they are mad. We don't have time to take this class and they are mad, but I explained to them that 
you know, it's not your job. It's required by law. Central bank or whomever is your regulator does ask for your training manual as well as um, your, your sign-in sheet. And they ask you, how many employees do you have? We have 30 employees. And on that sign-in sheet, they expect to have all the employees sign. They ask you for a list the name of the employees. And they detail that sheet because one person had signed twice on my sheet. And they send it back and this to Ms. Bullard. Let's say Mr. Mackey. Why did Mr. Mackey sign twice? We don't have a signature from Mrs. Roll. We'd like you to amend your sheet and send it back. So like I said, the Central Bank, the Securities Commission, the Compliance Commission, they've created these analytics departments. And so back in the day, we used to just send them any old thing and they never responded for months. Now, they respond in the same day, this bullet, this is incorrect, you know, and then they quote the penalties for false information and they, they make you feel like they're coming to arrest you right then. So gone are the days when you just send them any old nonsense and it doesn't make sense. They are checking, they are enforcing. Um, and like I said, we are being internationally watching. So they are on their um, P's and Q's are making sure you do what is right. And so, like I said, there are five statutory requirements. Of course, this is one of your essay questions. It's very easy. Um, identification is one. Um, let's see, in terms of record keeping is another. Training is another. And the MLRO is at five. On, and as well as monitoring. Okay, so they are the five, and normally the exam asks you to explain three of them. And so we are going to start with identification. Um, again, when you go into the bank, um, back in the day, you could take your passport and you can open up an account. Now, when you go into the bank, you have to um, show your passport. A lot of people say, I'm Bob but their name is Robert, you have to ensure that you get the correct name, the correct date of birth. You have to get the password number. You have to ensure that it's not um, expired. And then it says the activity undertaken, meaning establishing a profile, ensuring that we know that this account is for savings. These are the thresholds, like my peanut boy, he's not gonna go over $50. If he goes over $50 or five transactions a month, the system should alert me and I should know that that's a suspicious transaction. And so what um, the law requires you to do is to ensure that you verify who these clients are. They require you to know your customer, build relationships with them. They want you to ensure that you know where they live. If they have different houses around the world, they want you to fill that out. They want you to document that. They want, in terms of companies, they want a natural person. So what happened back in the day, um, I would establish a company, I would open up an account and let's just say, I call it um, AML International Inc. On my shareholders registry, I would send that into the bank and that would say Bullet & Co is the owner of AML International Inc. And so it did not stipulate who Bullet & Co was. People may assume that it's me, but it could have been me and Ben Laden. And so back in the day, we used to open accounts with a company's name on the shareholders registry, and it did not properly identify who that person was. And so for companies, the law requires you to have a natural person. So you are still allowed to send in that shareholders agreement with Bullet & Co on it. However, there must be a nominee agreement saying that I am holding the share on behalf of Bullet & Co and the owners or the natural persons behind this account is, and it's, whether it's me or three or four other persons, everybody has to be listed. Once those persons are listed, they then have to be verified, okay? And so in terms of an identification, we want full and correct names. We want two or more means of contacting the customer. We want date of birth. We want the purpose of the account, and if it's a business relationship, what type of business um, do you run? Because, of course, we know um, persons who deal with diamonds and oil and gas, our cash-intensive businesses, we consider them high-risk, okay? So we want to obtain all of that information. Now, 
Over the years, I've always been in a fight about over nationality versus citizenship. Some companies say it's the same thing. I say it's different. I think the nationality is where you were born and the citizenship is you can go to any country and apply for citizenship. So, you know, it really depends on your company and what their policies are. But I've always been in that argument. I'm not going to get in that argument today. And so after nationality and our citizenship, we want the occupation. And we want that occupation because we want to ensure that if you are the peanut boy again, we need to know how much money you make per month. So you can't be selling peanuts telling me that you make $50 a week, but you open an account with $5,000 and you bring me $5,000 every week. No, we want to check your um, source of income. We want to ensure that you know where this money is coming from. And so this is why a lot of companies ask for a job letter. In terms of if it's a high risk account, because again, most accounts are risk rated high, medium or low. If it's a high risk account, we want to check source of wealth. And what source of wealth is, I not only need a job letter, I perhaps need a reference letter from your bank where you say that you want to bring this money from. Or you can say that my father has passed away and he has left me this money. And so therefore, um, I have a will. Or I would have sold a piece of property as a, uh, a copy of the conveyance. And so that is source of wealth. And so that's the information that we ask for when it's a high risk um, account. Are we on track? Is this making sense? Yes. Yes. Everybody, okay, if you yes. lost, just raise your yes. hand and, and let me know, okay? So again, this is what is required under the statutory requirement of identification. So again, we need estimated levels of the account, the size, and in, in case of investment, what should we expect? Uh, your risk tolerances, your balance. Um, how much money do we expect you to deposit? What is the transaction volume? Um, we need a signature. Of course, if it's a company, we need to know. We ask for a resolution. We want to know that the company approves you opening this account. Back in the day when I was at Royal, the messenger had stolen um, some letterheads, wrote into the bank and said, I agree that this account should be open and this is the authorized signatory. So every time he ran out and he picked up checks from various companies that paid this institution, he deposited it to this account and he was just stealing the money that way. So we do require that you send in this letter authorizing the account to be open on the letterhead and sometimes with the company seal to ensure that we know who, who's allowed to open up an account on behalf of the company and who is able to sign. Um, we want two forms of contact. Now, back in the day, Central Bank had said um, proof of address, but in the family islands that had, you know, everybody is um, general delivery and they don't normally get bills. So that was an issue for a very long time. On the weekends, the managers had to go out to the um, houses and, you know, like how Cable Bahamas would say, turn right, turn left, and the red house, right? So they had to document that because even with collections, we found that a lot of persons in Abaco, when we went to repossess, we didn't even know where they lived because everything said uh, Marsh Harbor general delivery. And so we saw twofold that how that affected us collection-wise and in terms of what the regulator expected. And so um, they have recently relaxed that and the proof of address and they said two forms of um, communication, which can be telephone number, cell number, or email. Okay. And so we understand about um, source of wealth versus source of income. Source of income could be a job letter um, for source of funds or source of income. And if you are high risk, then source of risk, and then we want some documentation behind that. And so when these um, documents all come into the bank, we expect them to be certified. So on the retail side, of course, persons walk into the bank and we have our certified true and correct stamp and we sign that. However, if we work in the offshore world, we don't directly have contact with that client. We probably have a third party or we accept everything by email. So central bank allows us to accept everything by email 
but get the originals within 30 days. So the offshore world is very competitive. And so um, they give us that 30 day leeway to, you know, give the customer time to get all of these um, documents certified because again, they will have to go to, you know, various lawyers. If you have a customer out of the UAE, you know, Dubai, what have you, their law states that only their um, courts can certify true and correct copies of identity. And so they've had so much fraud that they said, if you go and open up an account and in 30 days, you do not receive from the government um, approved that we would have, you know, certified those documents, you accept that at your own risk and don't approach us if you have to take one of our um, citizens to court. Okay, so that's very important when you work with these offshore jurisdictions that you know what their rules are. So for the most part, you can, you know, get a certified public accountant, you can get an attorney at law, you can get a justice of the peace. They even say teachers now are minister of religion to certify these documents for you. However, um, some countries are very risky, let's say Russia. And so therefore there's something called an apple steel. And what Apple Steel is that you go something similar to the UAE, where you go to the Ministry of Finance in your country and they certify your documents. And we accept that if the Minister of Finance stands it and says, and this is who you are. And again, all of this is because you know there's a big black market on identification documents. So you want to ensure that you know you do have actual true and correct um, um, copy. And so Industry-wide, in terms of identification, you know, I went to seminars that the Central Bank and the Securities Commission said industry-wide documentation is very deficient. And why it becomes deficient is because in the offshore world, they are about, to open an account, there are about 30 different forms that you sign. And the person would sign one signature on the first page, and on the last page, the signature is different. Then there are three places that you put an address. And... Back in the day when we had to use proof of address, if you had three pages to, to put an address, persons automatically see, assume, well, I live in the Bahamas, and I live in the UK, and then I live in France, and so I have these three houses, and so they would put these three different uh, addresses. And then, of course, we had the common problem where the Roberts would be Bob's, the Williams will be Will, and, and the name just does not match the passport. So what is happening there is that the banks and the institution do not have a proper vetting system because the sales persons are very only concerned about opening up these accounts they're not concerned about you know um whether the information is correct or not so the bank should have a verification person in place to ensure that you know the balances the checks are done and a lot of times because compliance approves the account they expect compliance to be this verification person compliance is not this the verification person they need a verification in place to ensure that these documents are true and correct and they are certified properly another common problem is when we um receive information from other jurisdictions like russia or China and their in their language. So we would open up a file five years after it's open to do a check on it and we'd see that everything is in Chinese. Okay, nobody can speak Mandarin and so the central bank had to put in place and you'd see this in the guideline that all documents, if your client sends it to you in Mandarin and you accept it, you must have it translated to English because the inspectors are coming in and they don't know Mandarin, and they don't know, they can't learn every language to accommodate you. So it's up to the financial institution to ensure that this, um, these documents are in English and kept filed in English. Okay, this class is too quiet. I have to make sure. Shanria, you asleep or you up? You listening? I'm up. I'm up. Okay, and you retaining this? This is Claire? Yes, so far, yes. Okay, good. Any questions so far from anybody? Because that's just on the individual side. We are now going to go to identification of the companies. Elias? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, for the uh, that requirement that Central Bank has for, uh, for the uh, information to be in English, 
do you know if that's also the same for the Securities Commission? Because I was trying to find that information. Because I have, I have a client that uh, it's, uh, it's in Portuguese. And I told them that we needed the documents to be uh, either in English or translated in English. But someone was saying, I was trying to find the law in uh, the Securities Commission policy where it has to be translated. I know the central bank has it. But they are not, they're not uh, uh, the regulators for this particular company because it's an FCSP, is the Securities Commission. Do you know? Yeah. So I, I, the Securities Commission AML policy is only seven pages long, and they have another one that's 14 pages. And so they have other documents that accompany it. And so we always refer back to okay. the central bank guidelines, even if we're regulated by somebody else. And we can show that the Securities Commission policy is mimic what the central bank says. Exactly. And so they they don't want to enforce these things. If you accept it, you know, it's very it's a very competitive world. We normally offer a white glove service in the offshore world. And so therefore we'll accept it and we will find somebody to translate it and then charge them five hundred or a thousand dollars. So right. if the customer is adamant that they can't get it done. You know, just in the name of good customer service, we would, you know, arrange that for them. But I can tell you when the Securities Commission comes in, nobody there knows how to speak Portuguese and they will ask you for the translated document and you may even get a note. Yeah, no, there's just been a dis discussion back and forth in several offshore companies that I worked at and, and, and this is part of the issue. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, companies always accept, but then they don't want to pay to, to, to have it. Done. Yeah, they, they have to. They have to try to find a way around it, even though you tell them that. And so, yeah, that's going right back to being accountable as a compliance officer and an MLRO to ensure that these things are in place and they don't deviate from it. Right. And so if you're the compliance officer, you write it into your policy to say all documents must be kept in, in English and get the board to approve it and leave it at that. Yep. They can accept it from the client and they have to offer the service, but it cannot be on the file if it's not in English because that's what the regulators require. Exactly. And you should require that also because, you know, memos and arts and, and these are very long documents yes. um, um, to be translated. You don't want to mess you up to ensure that there are no bearer shares. You have to ensure that, you know, who are the directors and who the principals are. You can't take a chance with that. And if you open up the accepting Portuguese, that means you accept in Mandarin, Spanish, French, Russian, yeah. right? And so close that can of worms. Remember now, compliance does not make any money for the business. So we have to strike a balance between account opening and compliance. We have to ensure that the company remains compliant, but we also have to make some money. And so we strike a balance by telling them what the um, rules are, but this is a way we could offer a good service to the client. We don't want to frustrate the client. We don't want to deter the client. Right. So we will find somebody locally or arrange and, and you could debit them. You say, okay, sure, we can accept it. Um, your account will be debited $500 for the translation. Please sign on this and go end of the story. You'll have one or two clients that say, oh, no, I'm not going to pay that $500. But for the most part, they, they pay and, and they don't give you a problem. Right. Yeah. And so we must remember with this whole compliance thing, we cannot eliminate risk. We can only mitigate it. So if you get the majority to conform, you'll be okay. Don't don't stress trying to you know make everything perfect, and, and you will make mistakes. And I still make mistakes, and I don't have it all, and I still have to go out and do research. So there may be questions that you ask, and I don't know. You know, it's very comprehensive. Um, it's very detailed. I still have to do research. So don't be so hard on yourself, and and. You know, document everything. The way to protect yourself is just be organized. Document, send your emails, keep them on file. And when the regulators come and say, listen, I told them it had to be in. They didn't comply. I took it to the board. The board didn't see it was necessary. Here it is. I have my 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 document to, you know, cover myself. And, and that's it. But don't go to work stress every day trying to make all these changes. And, you know, it'll, we don't live in perfect. It'll never, you know, work out out the way we plan but or imperfect but like i say once you're organized and you have your source document and you can further it you'll be okay eliminate not um sorry it, it you can't eliminate it you could mitigate it
Okay. Okay. Good. So on the corporate side, of course, we know that we we require a certificate of incorporation. We require memorandums and articles of association. Um, we require the name of the registered agent, and so the Canadian banks are very conservative. You will have less problems. They normally have a parent. They trickle down all of all of this information from the parent, say in Canada, and you basically cover. They are very detailed in terms of what is required. And the Swiss banks, they are you know a little different. Um, they will come with the policy because. The central bank had left out that um, I think we needed articles of association. And so therefore, they used to come to me with the policy, Ms. Bullitt, you want more than what the regulator is asking for. Um, uh, you are too stringent. Um, you know, and then the regulator says, you shall do this and then you may do this. And so they also, you know, was in arguments with me every day. Now, I've been a Royal Bank for 16 years, so I was trained by the Canadians. The Canadians don't ever want to be in trouble with the regulator. And so what they do is they put more policies in place. They make them more stringent and stricter. So for instance, the regulator said, I want one form of ID. The Canadian banks normally say, I want two forms of ID. And again, it's just simply because they know they account for human error. They account for friends, lovers, and, and you know, associates where you would say, oh, I'll bring that back later and they never ever come back. And so they make it more stringent to ensure that they're never in trouble with the regulator. On the Swiss side, oh my God, if the Swiss, if the regulator say one form of ID, the Swiss will say, your proof of address is a form of ID, we can accept that. So, you know, the, the policy doesn't say this. So even though they knew that Central Bank had made a mistake and missed out articles of association and it was needed, they said that the bank, the regulator doesn't require it. And then when the regulator updated, you had to go back and fix all those files. It, it was crazy. So it just really depends on what type of institution you work for, whether it's Swiss or UK or Canadian, you will, you know, be in different atmosphere. But I'm I'm happy that I learned the strict way. And so, you know, um to me it's a better way. And when you know the world collapsed and you know the market fell. Canada still survive. And so, you know, to me, I attribute that to their conservative conservativeness. So it, it just depends on you. I mean, you do have to make money and it is a very competitive world, but you also have to protect your institution. So it just depends. So just so you would know that there's a difference when you go and apply for these jobs on on what each type of institution expects. Okay, and so we talked about getting a copy of that board resolution. We don't want the messenger stealing the letterheads and depositing the checks. So we want to know who the signatories are and who's authorized to sign. Um, we want evidence of all the signatories. So normally, um, you know, we find this to be a hassle because today I worked at Royal Bank and I was a signatory. Tomorrow I don't work there. And so now the account has to be updated. So in the past, they used to say, well, two persons. Um, can you can verify two signatories, but now they've enforced that all because now I might have been let go for stealing by reason of employment or money laundering or fraud, and so we want to make sure that I'm removed from that account and everybody's updated and they would know um, who I was. And in terms of controlling, we want to ensure that everybody who has more than 10% um, ownership in the company, we verify that person. And so because people want to stay below the radar, we now have share certificates coming in where it says that Ms. Bolido owns 8% of the company. Everybody else owns 50 and 40, but Ms. Bolido owns 80. And so of course that's a red flag right there because we know Ms. Bolido does not want to be verified. And so we ask for her um, identity documents anyway even though the law says, well, uh, of course, in the Canadian banks, we would, or and we would see that as a red flag, and we would say, no, we don't want to open this account if this person does not verify who he is. But in the Swiss bank, oh, no, that person has 8%. No, it, it, the, the law says 10. You don't need to ask for for their passport. You know, so like I said, it, it, it depends on um, where you work. Okay? Um, and then again, we want that good standing. Now, good standing, you don't get that immediately. 
if the company was just established, you normally get that a year after. So normally a company would just go and um, get incorporated and then they come immediately to the bank to open up an account. And so they would, you would not get that good standing until the following year to say that, yeah, they paid their fees and they, they're not struck off and they're not being sued for any reason. And so you have to put some um, reminder in the system. Hopefully your system is savvy enough to prompt you to let you know that that good standing um, is required. They would have opened today, May 9th, so next year. I need a reminder in the system to ensure that, you know, the documentation department gets that um, good standing. And then every year after, every year expires, we want to ensure that we get an, a current one. So potential parameters of the account, again, the size, we want to know that um, the profile is established. This is for savings. Let's talk about our good pastor, Edison Sumner. Everybody familiar with Edison Sumner? He was the deputy chair of the Chamber of Commerce. Anybody familiar with that case? Yes. No. Okay, so our good pastor, who on the board right now with uh, the Security well, Commission it's... lady, who just banned him for 10 years, right? So... Again, let's just say um, he opened an account for persons to invest in cryptocurrency. So you would have gone down to his company and say, oh, I want to invest in cryptocurrency. So he says, go down to the Scotia Bank and deposit your money into our account. And so he would have established this account at Scotia Bank and said, this, the purpose of this account is for persons to invest in cryptocurrency. And we expect them to deposit up to, say, $100,000 a month. So Scotia Bank would have verified, okay, fine, you have 25 customers and these are the customers and yes, we do expect these 25 persons to come in, make a deposit to your account for cryptocurrency. So he would have been investing for the, on these persons' behalf, but these persons never received a return. And somebody got, I think, Ansi went down to Scotia Bank and said, hey, what's happening? Scotia is going to be liable if somebody doesn't give me back my money. And so they started to investigate and they saw that, hey, this account used to have $1 million. Now it has $20 on it. And so when they look at the wire transfers, they now see that I bought a Lexus. I went to Miami. I um, you know, bought a new big screen TV with the money from the cryptocurrency account. So, so tell me who was, who was liable in, in that affair? Person spend the money. Yeah. Right. So who was the principals of the business? Edison Sumner and somebody else. Right? And so the person who was the CEO was banned from providing financial services for life. And Edison Sumner has been banned for 10 years because Edison was the secondary signature on the account. So while this person was buying a Rolls Royce for the people cryptocurrency money, he was signing as a signatory, but is he liable for putting his signature on those checks? He didn't get the Rolls Royce. Yeah, but his signature on yeah. now. He knew what he was should going have on. checked. Right. He right. Okay. You, said. you approved it. And if you know there's a cryptocurrency account, there should not be no wire going to Bahamas so you had to buy no tickets. Right? So yeah. you have to be when you sign up for these positions and you are on these accounts. You cannot say, I did not know, okay? Your signature means that you agree. A lot of people bring um, documents and they don't. They say, oh, this money to pay a bill for such and such. And people don't even look at it. They take their word, they sign their signature and go. And a loads of money has been stolen just like that because people simply, they are overwhelmed, they are overworked and they do not check. Or they just heavily depended on one person to, to do all the work and so therefore, Oh, yeah, send it to Miss Bullet. She can sign it. Yeah, Miss Bullet signing it, but I pay in for Bahama uh, tickets for the people's cryptocurrency money to take my family on vacation. Right? And so that's exactly what happened. And that's why people are outraged now that he is on this new board for economic stability or what have you. And that um, Christina Rule, who is the head of the Securities Commission, is all, also on that board. And she should say, well, no. This person should not be representing, Look, again, back to ethics and integrity and, and corruption. If you are banned, how can the government appoint you? 
and and even so when he was banned they said oh it's not really his fault um he's a pastor i don't even think he has to resign from the chamber of commerce mm -hmm. how can you not have to ex resign and 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 you banned for 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 10 years and so it, again his network is a, because of who he is and and he has um been able to um go on other boards and he's very active not in newspaper every day but you know it depends on who you are now i don't know his role in the whole fiasco but he he was uh, he should have been accountable he was the second signatory he signed the people lost their money and so i don't know but it, i guess it really just depends on who you are okay so this is what is important in terms of the parameters of the account and what the account is for. The same thing with the Michelle Rackley, with um, the, the relationship manager at CIBC and the relationship oh, manager at the Teachers Credit Union. This is a government employee. I bring in my pay slip to say I only made $2,000 a month. But I come in, it, when I used to work to the bank, if I saw government employees after, and no offense, any government employee are there, but if I saw government employees after the fifth of the month, I used to be like, what's going on? Because we know that those three days, you know, before the end of the month, that was government payday, and then the bank would slow down. But when you see a government employee constantly coming in, depositing 30, 40, 50,000, like there was no system in the background to alert you that she was outside of her profile. You didn't call her in for an update at, at, at all. When the people sent in the, the, subpoenas that's when you were surprised that's when you blocked the account and realized this woman had put a million dollars to her account okay. so who is now liable that relationship manager at cibc and that relationship manager at the teachers creative union and perhaps compliance Ms. so now you, now you see how you end up in jail miss bullard mm -hmm. um also the situation that that happened some years ago with uh, a worker at FIBC, I think. Um, she got in problems because the it was said that um, the prime minister, the former prime minister, uh, um, told her to extend. Um, I think it was his relative or his wife relatives or something like that um, to extend the the payments on his property. I think it, it was supposed to, they were supposed to put a closure on it. And he spoke to the lady and, and because of it, I think she got fired from the, the internet, the, I guess the head from abroad came down and dealt with the situation and she got fired right because of right. course of course now you know that's the prime minister of the country that's we consider that a pet and mm -hmm. so that's another uh in terms of identification we want all pets to be identified and we want to ensure that those um um accounts are considered high risk and somebody had to come down from the parent bank because of course nobody locally you know, we have some some people on these boards who, you know, ride or die. They ain't giving up their life for the PLP and for the FNM. So you have to be careful. And so it's good to have a, an outsider who has, you know, is not a friend, a family, or a lover of, of these groups and, and could actually deal with it and do what is right. And so that sometimes you need to get outside out. Because like I say, just with Edison Sumner, yes, he is. How do you measure man? He is. A pastor he has done a lot for the community so does that mean that we turn a blind eye to what he has done wrong you don't turn you praise him up for what he has done right but you don't turn a blind eye to what he has done wrong because a lot of people have lost their money now if he goes and pays the money back and perhaps we could you know reconcile but i i don't know if the people got their money back yet so until the people got their money back i i i'm concerned you know, because you could make a mistake and you could have been negligent and unaware. You know, you might have been put in that position and not properly trained. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. But 
okay, now you know that what you sign up for and get the people back their money and then we, we start, you, you know, to the next step. So, yeah, sometimes with these people, these high ups or these big executives, you have to bring in an outside person uh, to deal with these situations or, you know, a blind eye will be turned to it. Okay, it just depends who, who you are and who is in your network. Okay, so again, um, so we understand parameters. We understand um, the importance of generating a profile. We know if we don't know the profile of the client, we don't know that this is an unusual transaction, right? If we don't know this client, if I don't know that this is a government employee, if I don't know that this is the peanut boy, how do I know they can't afford this, right? So this is what verification um, entails. And so, um, yeah, uh, list, you want a list of registers and directors. You want to ensure, you know, um, who these people are, and then you world check them. And you ensure um, that they don't have any, you know, criminal activity linked to them. You want copies of the power of attorney. You have to, um, especially if you're dealing with Panama or any of those Latin American countries, you will see that just like how all the Bahamas name rule and, and Johnson, yeah, yeah, we have a lot of the sources and the silvers and, and what have you. And so you have to get their passport to be able to ensure that this is the right Miguel, the sources, the silver, um, um, when you verif verify it. So all of this is what the central bank um, requires you to have in place. Okay, so that's just a statutory and overview of the statutory requirement for um, identification. So when you go into the banks now, stop complaining, stop giving the people a hard time and saying, you all want my whole life, you all want my children birth certificate. No, it's required by law. It's a statutory requirement. If they don't get all this information, they should not open the account for you. Okay, now the next statutory requirement is record keeping. It means that um, you can't just take this information and cast it to the side. The law requires you to retain central bank, for the banks require you to retain that information five years after that account is closed. So they want to ensure that, you know, um, you can go into your archives and ensure that um, you pull out this information should they need to investigate. So that's on the central bank side. The Securities Commission say, no, we need this information for seven years. And so therefore, if you have a license, a lot of people have a securities arm where they are buying and they do, they have a trading desk. And so they have both licenses for the Securities Commission and the Central Bank. And so to make life easy, they just keep all the documents. Again, on the Canadian side, they would keep it for 10 years because they don't want to be in trouble with the regulator. Because again, human error, I could go in the filing room and say, you know, space, I got to shred some of these stuff. I'm back. I miss and shred some stuff that the regulator may come for. Or on the Swiss side, they say seven years, seven years, we keep everything for seven years on the dot. So to make your life easier, um, you should have a retention list. You should, some things need to be kept indefinitely, like the bank itself, licenses and you know, some HR information. But for the most part, anything customer related must be accessible to the regulator um, seven, five years on the central bank side, seven years. And I think the gaming board and the compliance commission and the insurance commission are, are have the same five or seven year uh, policy that you must retain this information. So a, a lot of banks have closed down, but they had to send a letter to the central bank saying that Ms. Bullet is my contact person. Should She has the keys to our archives. Should you need any information, you contact her she will go into our archives and deliver any information on our behalf. So you can't just pack up and, and say, oh, my bank closed. I don't have to follow those, these laws. No, even after your bank closes, you have to retain that information for uh, the statutory amount of years. If you don't keep that information, you can be fined um, for an individual up to $20,000 and for a corporation, hundred thousand dollars okay so that's the statutory requirement for record keeping statutory requirement for training employees must have annual training annual that means once per year so when your compliance department sends out these trainings or invites you and you're too busy to um 
attend, remember that you're breaking the law, or you are a big executive, and so no, listening to me just yes for the staff. No, Central Bank has a, um, I forget what they call it, the board something policy, something policy came out to 18, and now even the board has to be um, trained. And would that stem from one of the ladies who are the inspectors at the Central Bank? She was in my class, and you know, she said, this was a few years back, say around 215, 216, and she said, Ms. Bullard, do you believe that I was having a water cooler conversation with one of the board members, and I said, how do you handle your pets? And normally on some of these boards, you know, they have a priest there. I guess the priest is there to keep the peace. You know, they have people from different aspects of the community, um, or if it's on a bank, you know, a financial service, um, since background is required if you're on a bank board. And so she said, do you believe that person said, I don't know what a PEP is, and the PEP is a politically exposed person. And she said, we have to put something in place in the board has to be created. We cannot be on these boards and not know the basics, right? And so now it's not only the staff, everybody, including the board, has to have that annual training. And again, like I said, they are enforcing that. They want acknowledgement sheets. They want tests. They want grades to see. And what percent this person is a board member? Oh, let me see what they got on their um, test. And the test isn't hard. And the training isn't as detailed as this. This is a, a certification course. And so this is why we go in a little bit more detail. But normally, you know, your jobs will just tell you what anti-money laundering is, tell you about the products and services that are applicable to your, your um, company. And then you sign off and do a little test. So stop not showing up to those trainings. Stop getting annoyed by them. They are required by law. And I can tell you if you are, your company gets a fine because they did not um, conduct the training, uh, that won't sit well with your company. I'm sure you won't get a bonus and you may even get let go. In fact, last year, um, I am out to about three different institutions where they outsource their training to the institute because the FIU sent them a warning saying that if your training is not completed by such and such a day, you will be fined $20,000 and then $5,000 a day. So that's how serious they are about training, okay? And so again, the book just talks about what new training, um, new employees should um, um, expect, new employees should get the general information on money laundering and terrorist financing within the first month of employment. They should know who the MLRO is. They should know where they um, suspicious transaction is. They should know um, the written policies and procedures um, of the company and their legal requirement to report. And again, we just read that in uh, POCA law that says you are required to disclose. Okay, so don't sign up for these jobs and then, you know, um, turn around and say, I didn't know, I'm not comfortable. And there have been a lot of people who have refused to give information because they are afraid. But, um, you know, you once you sign up for these jobs, you have to. And so normally it would be the MLRO or the CEO that goes to court. It won't be the teller or somebody from the front line. But you do have an internal form that you fill out and you give them information. And so they up in the last years because they have had so many complaints where people say, oh, I'm just a teller. That's not my job. No, compliance is everybody's business. Wherever you are in the institution, you are to disclose or um, you can be fined or, or charged. Yeah, Ms. Bullard? Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, just about wanted to you to elaborate in terms of well, explain about the politicians who have to, I think every maybe two years or I don't know the time that they have to disclose their assets. Who regulates that for them? Well, again, um, I'm not certain who regulates that, but they are required to do it. Uh, Again, the prime minister should enforce it. It is against the law, but again, you know, everybody turns a blind eye to it, but they are, it, the disclosure is a part of the requirement. And so the prime minister should, again, put his foot down and say, you have not disclosed, you will not be eligible. I think once you disclose, then you pay $400 to be able to run. And so they should not be accepting that $400 if the disclosure is not out there. I think it's Bahamas Information Services or, or somebody to that effect who who um, mans the disclosure. I'm not certain there, but there sh that should be enforced. Right, because uh, a lot of them they sometimes they do it late. They don't. Um, yeah. 
and it's exclusive. Actually, it's not annually, actually. Is it annual or okay. requirement? No, it's normally just before the election. No, but it's annual requirement. Right. Yeah, they have oh, it is an annual requirement. Oh, okay. Well, okay. You have to do it continuously where I well, say, you know, in Parliament. Okay, yes, of course, we want to ensure that they get no kickbacks or what have you. And I know with Brent Semenek, the last, the first time he ran, he only had 56 million. And this last time he ran, he disclosed 156 million. So, of course, you know, the people went crazy. They're like, where Brent Semenek had this 100 million from? And so, again, he's a pep, he's high risk. He had the, this, we didn't use source of income, we used source of wealth. And he had to bring in a will, his death certificate of his mother, as well as his will, where his mother had willed to him $100 million. And people were mad. But I said, no, try and figure out how you can will to your children $100 million. <laughs> right? That's what you need to do. Learn from these things. Okay? So he did disclose and he was able to prove, you know, where he got that money from. So you all work on that. Even a, 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 a inheritance for your second generation, the Bible says. But anyway, back to class, back to class. Okay, so we know what new employees should get. We know what employees dealing directly with the public, a little bit more advanced training, um, um, particularly when it in involves large cash transfers. Not everybody that drains in money is money laundering. But again, there is, and people will come in outside of their profile and so it's normally a form called a declaration source of funds. And if they are able to declare that I sold this piece of property and this is where I get the $20,000 from, then you accept it and there's no issue. But you do have to have source document and proof. Um, persons dealing with certificates of deposits or letters of credit and guarantees, we want special training in those areas. And we want them to um, understand the risks associated with those types of services. Um, Central Bank mentions that anybody working in the correspondent banking department, which is, deals with all the wires, they not only have an annual training, but a second training is required. And last year, at the end of 2019, you know, Central Bank did send a letter. They said, we would like a list of all the persons in your wiring department and their CVs. Please um, show us a log where they have, would have had at least two trainings and so we had to produce that log as well for them so you can't take it lightly um that you know that that is what the law requires and account opening officers and then managers as you step up we want to again you're managing um employees so you require a little bit more advanced training and also when you're at the board we want you to know about the penalties we want you to know about the um offenses we want you to ensure that you know what a PEP is and all the correct terminology so central bank um well even out of that um central bank said once per year they're going to do a surprise visit you know they're normally four board meetings and so once per um year they're gonna sit in on one of the board meetings and and don't be tricked they're not gonna you know um give you a a test right up front they expect the compliance would have tested you on the knowledge that you would have learned in your training, but they will have those water coolers conversations with you where they ask you questions and that's your test right there. So don't be tricked. They, they ain't just being friendly. They want to know, you know, they say hello, you know, they exchange um, courtesies and then they say, so how do you do this and how do you do that? And that's your test. So make sure you don't, you know, you know the correct terminology is and when you speak into the uh, inspectors you you know the correct thing to say okay so again that is training statutory requirement identification statutory requirement record keeping statutory requirement training okay so next statutory requirement after we would have gotten all this good information we now must risk rate our clients and so depending on um who they are where they are from what type of businesses they are involved in. Um, each company should have a risk rating sheet or form, and it normally has like 13 categories. Um, the Bahamas, um, the country is risk rated as well, and this is why we're trying to, we're medium high right now. We haven't pre, um, completed our risk um, 
rating form since 2016. And so if you go to the Basel Index, that risk rate countries, um, that will tell you that there's no information in place for us. And that's because, you know, there are various sectors, the insurance sector, the gaming board, the banks, um, the real estate agents and law firms who have just been regulating, don't believe they have to do all of this, the credit unions who are now regulated by the central bank and don't believe they have to do all this work and put all this infrastructure in place. So all of them have to come together to fill out the form for the country's risk rating. And so we don't want our, our risk rating to increase. And so therefore we are medium high now. And so this is why the governor has put uh, a moratorium on the Western unions and the cash for growth and what have you, because they are considered cash intensive business says the number houses are cash intensive businesses and i don't know if you all saw the other day some one of the number houses they were in court for something and their license was immediately revoked that's it so i think we've gone from seven number house licenses to six and so all of this is because we want to ensure that the bahamas is not too cash intensive the governor also put in place that um a dare bill um of some type of what do you call it? Um, it's not cryptocurrency, but it's um, digital currency. And they tested it in Exoma and they were getting ready to roll it out in the Bahamas. So when you all see the day up, they'll come out and they say, we want this digital currency, you know, be aware of that and support that because that's one of the initiatives to ensure that we're not marked as, as high risk because we already blacklisted and we get junk status rating. If we get listed as a high risk jurisdiction that means higher um percentages on borrowing money and you know we need to borrow a lot of money and then we are subject then to high um um enhanced due diligence versus simplified due diligence and again if you know for us who know the difference um uh, when it's a, a high risk you're subject to more monitoring you're subject to source of wealth versus source of income everything has to be checked and you know it's way more requirements. So we're trying, the governor, governor is trying to, you know, put stuff in place. He's decreasing the leverage on the Securities Commission side because I think our leverage is like 200, 200% more than any other country. So he's decreasing the leverage from like 400 to 200 or 300, which will still be, you know, competitive because a lot of people come here to, you know, open up accounts to trade because our leverage is higher than other jurisdictions. But those type of things also make you high risk. So, like I said, support when you see this digital currency. There's a white paper out on it right now. It's gonna be, um, it's gonna be regulated by the Securities Commission. So go and read the white paper. And if you have any suggestions of any of you are savvy in that area, if some of you already invest, invest in cryptocurrency, um, please give some comments and, and, and join these forums and these groups and, and give some advice on how we, um, you know, can support these initiatives. Ms. So Fuller. Go, yes, go ahead. Um, with the digital currency, um, I'm not sure if Sun Cash was able to roll it out as yet. But I know they were working on where you could deposit funds to your account with them. And you could just use your phone. You would have a Sun Wallet and stores that agreed to use their platform. You could use your phone instead of taking actual cash because they would scan your phone. Okay. And your funds would be debited from the account. But I'm not sure if they completely ruled mm -hmm. that out as yet. Right. Okay. So good. So follow that, Natasha. Thank you for sharing that. Follow that and, and make sure that it works. And I mean, do your own research so you can feel secure, but support these initiatives because those initiatives going digital will help us to remain, um, you know, maintain our medium and perhaps lower our status because we don't want the risk to go higher. And so once you would have received all this information, you know, the proof of address, the passport, the type of business this person is involved in. You put all of this information into a form, what we call a risk rating form. And this rate, risk rating form spits out the total. It tells you if you're high, medium, or low. And so if you're high, you are monitored annually. That means we do a full review on who you are, um, what type of businesses you are in. We check these transactions to make sure you're going on the Bahamas Air flight with the 
people's money and being sure that you invested in only sending wires to the right place. Right? We check that you stay inside your frequency um, on the account signatories. We do a world check on them to make sure that Miss Bullet is teaching the AML program today and tomorrow she goes and commits a crime because of the pandemic. Right? So I'm law abiding today. Tomorrow I could be a criminal. That's how fast it happens. So in monitoring, these are the type of things you want to check. So again, if you're high risk, you're monitored annually. If you are medium, um, it's every two years. And if you are low risk, every three years. So let me give you an, an instance of monitoring. We had an account for Brave Davis' daughter's boyfriend. Okay? And he got married to Brave Davis' daughter. So tell me what changed and tell me what happened. He is now He's a now pop. Pop. Okay. So how do I know that? I saw this in the newspaper and I said, hmm. This may have sound familiar. Let me put this in our system and see who this guy is. Because he was enough for review, but this was like his second year. Um, so in one more year, I would have um, reviewed him and I should know my customer. And so I should have been able to call him up on the phone and say, hey, any substantial changes? And then he would have said, oh yes, I got married. And I would have said, anybody in particular, anybody of interest? Because we are supposed to build a relationship with our client. And so he said, oh, yeah, I married the Japanese prime minister's daughter. Oh, I said, oh, ding, 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 ding. Okay, so now I need to change this account to high risk. I need to label him as a pep, and I would have gotten this information. Or I could have gotten it from the newspaper if it was announced, or just through my network. And so I would have been okay for the first three years if until I was supposed to call him on the phone, because you are one part of this monitoring, you call these people up on the phone and find out any changes. But had Central Bank come in, I would have been, I, my, you know, my rebuttal would have been, well, he is enough from, or, or not even Central Bank audit, he is enough from review until the third year, and this is only the second year, and I would have been okay. But had it been the fifth or sixth year, no, I am required to know my customer. I would have gotten a note for not knowing that he would have married and now is a pet. And so again, when these people run for government, you know, sometimes there are some new faces. You sit with your newspaper to your system and you make sure that, hey, um, this person who I've never heard for, you know, heard of is now the commissioner of the police. Or he is married or this or that. So you're required to know. Okay? Okay. Okay, good. So we understand monitoring. It depends on how you are risk rated, and that's how you are monitored. Okay, and we are required to know and, and, and you know update the systems to reflect and update your account to reflect. Okay, statutory requirement MLRO. We all know by now who the MLRO is, the Money Laundering Reporting Officer. That's why we're in this class. Most of us, we hope to get into the compliance department and, and, and you know achieve um, this function. And so we know that it's a regulated function. We know that the banks can call us in. We can see it in the papers. They can have an interview. We can go to the interview. The bank can say, yes, I want you. But they then have to go out to the regulator and ask for approval. And that bank or financial institution is not allowed to hire us. They can hire us as a compliance officer, but they cannot give us that MLRO designation until the regulator sends back an approval. Once we would have gotten that designation, then we are required to um, report to the FIU that we have been approved as the uh, MLRO of this particular company, and we need, they, they can expect um, suspicious transaction reports from us. Okay, and so the person's on the front line, um, who see the customers or even on the back who work with this very savvy systems and they get reports each day that shows them that, you know, people are outside of their profile or something funny is happening in the account. They have an internal form that they fill out. They send it to their managers or they send it to compliance. Compliance will then do an investigation because sometimes the people on the front line don't always have the full picture or all the answers. We do an investigation we find out why this person would have deposited the sum of money or why this money would have been wired somewhere. After we would have done the investigation, then we determine whether or not this person should be reported to the FIU. For instance, right now I have a director, you know, and 
normally the system checks your name every night. And so up until April, this director was okay. I have all my world checks and my hits on file where, you know, I had no hits against his name, but um, sometime in April, I see that he's been charged with embezzlement. Now he is not the beneficial owner of the account. He is just somebody has power of attorney on the account. Okay. And so some people would question, do we need to report that? Of course, if he is being charged with embezzlement and he is, um, all his assets are being freezed, the FIU would want to know that he is attached to an account in Bahamas. They will investigate to see if any of this money belongs to him or, and if it doesn't, they will just recommend that he is removed from this account. And the beneficial owner can find another power of attorney, another attorney, what have you, to handle his business. But we will not, you know, it should be in your company's policy that once a person is charged, you know, we no longer do business with them. And so in your AML policy, in the beginning of bars is on the third or fourth page, um, undesirable persons or undesirable accounts. And they are persons who would have been charged. Now, some people are charged and acquitted. And so if they are acquitted, we do ask them to bring back in, you know, a letter from their lawyer saying that they were acquitted. And then, yes, we can do business with them. But once you have some type of history or we get some hit in the Canadian bank, of course, we don't do business with you. We don't fool around with the Russia and the Venezuela and all the rest of the stuff. In the Swiss bank, of course, we do business with Iran and Russia and Venezuela. And the risk is way higher, and that's why you should be paid more money. But just, just, just so you know the difference. And then um, we do ask for a lawyer, a letter from your lawyer, to um, verify that you're no longer charged. Okay. Okay. okay Ms. So, Miss Bullard, question. So, mm -hmm. if, for instance, say I am related. I'm the daughter of Dwight, the um, the drug dealer. Dwight Major, yes. Yeah, would I be at? Would you have to put me as a high risk because I, of that? I, I I I would personally put you as as high risk. I would personally put you because I was at um the bank back in 2000 when the banks had shut out all of them. The, the, Somebody had gone to the central bank and reported there, and these laws were not enforced back then. And so what they did is everywhere they had an account, they were made to put a, give them a check, especially after the wife had been um, found with that $800,000 in cash. So we had to prepare a check payable to them. First Caribbean prepared a check payable to them. And so basically we put them out of the financial services system. And so, you know, I would, monitor you closely to ensure that you know you're not infiltrating the financial services sector with drug money or any affiliates but you can you can't you know you're not responsible for your fathers or your sisters you know you can't condemn these people to the world and he would have been to jail and already paid his debt to society so again if he approached us if the canadian banks will say no but you know, back in the day, we used to have all the number houses, accounts now, they say no. So it, 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 it just really depends. It's good to, you know, watch it to make sure that you protect yourself, you know, who your customers are. You don't necessarily have to make a high risk, but I would put on increased monitoring. And so really, you know, what I was taught on the Canadian side is that's really the only way to track these accounts, because again, you're busy and to get a reminder, hey, let me monitor this person to make sure they ain't doing nothing out the way, is to make them high risk. On the Canadian side, they support that. On the Swiss side, no, no, no. You can't have all these people making it high risk. Our business is going to be high risk. But then you'll have 10 other indicators trying to make remind you of these different things. And it's hard when you work with a group of people and you have a lot of accounts to control all these things. So the best way for me is to make them high risk. And so they're subject to increased monitoring. And you always document. Normally compliance has to send a report to the compliance committee each month. And they say, this person is high risk because she's the daughter of the white major. This person is high risk because of the, they are involved in gas and oil and diamonds. You know, so you have a reason there. So com um, the committees are 
aware of why you have increased monitoring on these people. Not because you don't like the person or, you know, but you just want to be um, sure. And then when the person is up for a review, I have said, listen, I've monitored, monitored this person for the last five years. I recommend, you know, they have stayed within their profile and the system will still alert me if they go out. I recommend that we reduce their risk rating to medium. You know, you can do that. But in the onset, you know, try it out for a few years just to feel, until you feel secure. And like I say, document your reasoning. Because a lot of times we say, this person is high risk and we don't even know why. And there's no documentation to find out why. God forbid if you was a new person and the last person didn't keep proper documents, you don't know why these accounts block or why these, you know, and there's no documentation on file. And so, you know, all of that is a part of it. The monitoring isn't properly tracked. It's not properly documented. We don't even know why. We have this person, you know, listed this way. Okay? Okay. Okay, any more questions or concerns? Um, we see if you're gonna do this one for homework, um, again, you only have to talk about three of them and why they are important and why they must, you know, everything is being enforced now. We know in our institutions that when we see this email from compliance saying anti money laundering treatment is required by a certain day, we don't know, oh my God, we run away from it, we postpone it, not knowing that we're making their life hard because when Central Bank say send us the training log we have to run around to all the departments saying please do the training please right but it just really depends on the culture and whether we enforce these things or not or if the staff buys in and they, they support you know policy and procedure and ensure that we maintain a lot of times we don't even know that these are the laws so people don't take it seriously right elias yes ma'am Okay, so what's your input? Any feedback? Um, no, mom, not as yet. Okay, this was clear as mud? Yes, mom. Okay, good, good. And so you know what our five statutory requirements are? Yes, mom. Okay, good. What about you, Dimitri? Dimitri, you still up? Yes, I am. Yeah, okay. Avery, our, our new person. Avery, what about you? Any questions? No, mom, no questions. Um, but I mean, it's not really related to. No, okay, MLRO, okay, you're I very was, silent. You're very silent. I've taken away 10 points today, no 10 points for participation today. What you all say about no, that? No, I have a question. No, okay, no response. Okay, okay, I have a question. But anyway, Miller. that's statutory requirements, that's an overview of the laws. Um, next week, we'll talk Ms. about Bullard. chapters five and chapter six, the FATF, the CFATF, the International mm -hmm. Monetary Fund, who these people are and what they do. Um, if you look on page, I might have a different page, but it says process and timeline about the third page exactly. into the chapter. That was um, from 2018, and what happened was that the um, IMF came in and they did a review and they insisted that we update um, our disaster recovery plan. And they did that in 2018. And there's a lot of controversy and a lot of news out there surrounding what happened in Parliament and what they did and why it was very beneficial. So read up on that so we can have a discussion on the, it should be the IMF consultation paper from their meetings in December 2018 and, and, and we can discuss that next week. Okay, so if there are no other questions, queries or concerns, no more discussions, nobody else wants to share, that's Somebody three and four. Somebody can you else. repeat what it is we have to read for next week, please? No, silence? Okay. Well, I don't think she can hear us. <laughs> yeah, I don't thank think you she again, can hear us. Brenda, for Hello. You know, leading cool. the board, um, taking the initiative. Um, thank you, Hello. everybody who attended. With, um, Brenda, okay, somebody is saying they can't hear me. Can 
Can Great. anybody uh, else not hear me? Savannah, can you hear me? You can't hear us. I can hear you. I have two people who have questions. Okay, thank you. I can hear you. Who are the two people that have questions? Oh, Tashay, go ahead, Tashay. Okay, so I can't hear you all. Okay. Hello? 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 Yes, I can hear you now. I don't know something that happened. Okay. Wait, y'all could have heard me or no? Yes, we could have heard, heard, heard you, but you couldn't hear us. us. Oh, okay. So let me see this. One second. Because two people have questions. Good. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Deshae. Sorry. No, I was trying to alert you that, that yeah, everyone was trying to alert you that you couldn't hear us. Oh, okay. No thank question. you. <laughs> okay. And anybody else had a question? It was yes, I wanted you to repeat. Read. Yes, that is the question. Sorry, I didn't get the question. What was the question? I think you was giving us something to read or to go over. Oh, you can hear me. Okay, so the IMF is, like I said, on the third or fourth page in your book of chapter five, it talks about the process timeline. And that timeline is when the IMF came in um, in December of 2018, and they had a consultative paper at the end of their um, visit. And one of the things that they encouraged us to do before they left is to update our disaster recovery plan and so i want sorry somebody saying something so you could go on to google and read into our newspapers exactly what happened regarding our disaster recovery plan there was three things that the government did they got some backlash from the opposition and you can read up on that to find out why the opposition was against it and what ended up happening and why it was beneficial to us. Okay. Okay, so look for Bahamas IMF consultation plan December 2018, and that will give you some information so we can have a discussion next week. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? You said the Bahamas IMF consultation plan yeah yeah so when they left they they made some recommendations and i it, there are about five or six recommendations on there i want you to specifically tune in to the one on disaster relief the disaster relief plan and i want us to discuss why that was so timely and so important okay because a lot of times we, again, see the regulator as a bully. They put all these things in plus, they force it down our throats, they blacklist us. But this was the time when they really, really helped us. And it was very, very timely. Like in the nick of time, they made a recommendation and the government was vigilant and followed immediately. Okay, so, and then if anybody wants to turn in their homework, um, I think some homework, two pieces should be due next week. So please don't turn in your homework. Um, like don't try and check, hand in chapter two next week. Chapter two will not be accepted next week as a homework. Okay, so try your best to follow the dates. And if you have any issues, I can be reached by email. And just, just let me know that you experience some issues. And if you feel overwhelmed and you want to ensure that you get your grade back first before you complete another piece, then fine, you can wait till the following week, you know, to complete another piece. Hi, Miss Bullard. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. I see number one is due Friday, May 22nd. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. What happened is I didn't want to overwhelm you on the first class we're trying to give you two pieces uh, at one time and i wanted the terrorist okay. financing to be mandatory 
So th that's why I did it like that. Okay. Yeah, because I still wanted to give you the option to, to complete it, but just give you some more time. All righty. Yeah, so chapter two, yeah. so question two is mandatory for the new persons. That would be Elias, Dimitri, and Avery. And so they are the only three persons I am going to accept chapter two from next week. Everybody else should have already handed that in. Okay, and Deandra is asking, is we're still giving our contact number. So if you want to put Brenda, Brenda, should they just send it to you? Is Brenda still here? Okay. Yes, I can just send it to me. Okay, I yes. Can, I, put my WhatsApp, I put my cell number there so they can just send me their numbers if they want to be included in the WhatsApp group. Right. Yeah, so send it to Brenda. And thank you, Brenda, for you know coordinating that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if there are no other questions or concerns. You'll have a fabulous weekend. Please take some time to enjoy yourself and unwind and then get back to studying next week sometime or tomorrow. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Y'all take care and have a good one. You too. You too. Okay.